Okay, it is now 6.30. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for uh, putting the garden to bed for winter. This is our second time offering this format. We did this last year, and normally we have um, one sort of keynote master gardener who does a presentation, and then we do all of your questions at the end, except for ones about like, what did she say? And things like that. Um, and we have two master gardeners fielding the, those in the chat. But today it's totally a panel. Um, my name is Darby Love and I work at Nanaimo North Branch slash Parksville branches right now. And <laughs> that is Stanamo, Stananas, and Qualicum First Nation. Qualicum First Nation. Yeah, because Parksville's in this funny, I found this out today, Parksville's kind of in between established nations. Um, so you can go ahead and put your uh, where you're coming from, what nation land you're on in the chat. It's kind of nice to for us to see that and to interact with each other in the chat. And we want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and all of these people here for partnering with Vancouver Island Regional Library on the program to bring you great science-based information that's uh, specific to where we live. And uh, thank you to Joe Canning. She's in the orange jacket there. Um, and she was key in creating the program. Richard has been wrangling all the master gardeners and the librarians for the last few years. <laughs> Adults are difficult to organize. Uh, so thank you, Richard, for doing that with all of us. Oh, again. Kittens. <laughs> uh, like herding cats. We are <laughs> we are recording this session, but only our faces and names are going to be on the session. Yours are all hidden from view. Um, and yeah, use the chat. We like using the Q&A feature for asking April, oh, can you see the Q&A feature? Yeah, it's there. Okay, it's not on yep. my screen, but that's great. So please use the Q&A feature. It's just much easier to keep track of your questions because um, then we can ask, mark them as answered and things like that. So we're gonna try group questions maybe a little bit by um, theme. Um, so this is totally about what you want to hear and uh, you always have great questions. We're not worried. Okay, great. I'm just gonna introduce our speakers. We've got Richard Bernier. He's got the Northern Lights very bright behind him. His gardening hobby started as a preteen when one of his elderly neighbors hired him, which was his first job to help them in their garden. They showed him which plants were weeds and directed him to a veggie garden that was in dire need of weeding. Uh, he's gardened on and off till he's in his teens. And then he discovered indoor plants and he started his journey in plant husbandry and the gardening spider mites maybe had bitten him. And after moving to the coast in 1994, he became enamored with the climate and dealt a taste I'm for exotic heaven. plants, both indoor and outdoor. Normally Richard has really amazing Hoyas behind him um, in this forum. So that's yeah. Richard. And he's got a great um, house plants uh, talk that we can uh, link in the chat as well and then we also we have deborah deborah grad with the pinky wall behind her she became interested in early in gardening at an early age from watching her parents who are both in their 90s and still gardening is that still current deborah uh, my my dad's gotten a bit frail and he's kind of stopped but my mom is still puttering in her little garden there you go in 2019, she was able to fill her dream of becoming a master gardener and has begun, be, been, sorry, I can't talk, with the uh, Vancouver Island Master Gardener Association ever since. She's particularly interested in pruning. She did our last session about pruning roots uh, for successful transplanting, which I admitted to Richard I was not particularly interested in, but was fascinated by <laughs> So oh. good job. <laughs> Even if you don't think you need to watch that, you should. And she likes veggie gardening as well. She's a retired teacher who still loves to teach. And she really enjoys sharing all of her knowledge with you folks. Dorothy, 
Dorothy Keeser has been a certified master gardener for 12 years. She's in the yellow. She brings uh, her scientific approach from her career as a biologist, as well as a wealth of experience from her extensive home orchards, veggie, flower, and roto gardens. In addition to her volunteer work with the Master Gardeners, Dorothy is an active member of the Bebbin Learning Gardens. So if, you've, uh, if you are in the Nanaimo area, you might have met Dorothy there. And it's a really big local community garden with a greenhouse. She has done lots of these topics and she still has the most watched um, topic of all of the topics, which was my favorite vegetables and how to grow them. So again, congratulations, Dorothy. <laughs> she, she was at least president of the Vancouver Island chapter of Vimga um, and does a lot to ensure that the high standards are kept in the program and um, making sure that we're keeping to that scientific rigor. Okay, and I think we just have Joe. Joe in the orange. Uh, she's a senior master gardener. She teaches and writes about sustainable gardening and food security in our changing climate. Um, did you do the the uh, climate change and how to how to cope session, Joe? Was that you? Uh, I I might have. Yeah, There's... we've got one on that anyway. But yeah, it's it. I think I think I did that one. I kind of have quite a few. So I'm... yeah, it's yes, you have. Ago. It was a few years ago. But it's still yes. relevant. She's yes. a mental plant enthusiast, a year-round urban food gardener of over 35 years. She's taught at Van Dusen Garden, Horticultural Associations and Garden Clubs, VIU's Master Gardener Training Classes, Horticultural Technicians Program at VIU's Pain Center, and her articles and photos have appeared in many magazines in Canada and abroad. Okay, so now you know how qualified these four lovely people are. Um, let's see if we have any questions. There is a question. It says that Deborah's typing an answer. Well, I decided maybe it'd be better to answer this for everybody. So just talk. Yeah. Yeah, just to talk. Um, the question is about uh taking a, a plant out of a pot and washing the roots and then planting it in another newer, hopefully bigger pot, and if it's okay to cut off the roots. I, I think in that case it would be, because if you're gonna circle the roots in order to fit them in the pot, you're just setting up for circling roots again. When you have a, a plant that's gonna basically live its pretty much entire life in a pot in your yard, you will need to repot every now and then, wash all the planting medium off, correct the roots, uh, trim the roots a little bit to fit and then pop back up again. If you don't do that, the roots will eventually circle, circle, and it'll just kind of choke itself out. So in, in that case, if you're not planting it in your garden in the ground, yes, you can cut some of those really long roots off rather than circle. And I, and I think too, one of the keys in, in keeping plants in container um, is how large do you want it to get? A lot of times people will say, oh, God, it keeps growing out the pot. I have a bigger pot. No, no, just, just trim the roots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, bonsai artists have been doing that for a thousand years. And that's actually partly how you control the size. Exactly. Uh, we, had a wonderful, we had a wonderful hedge that was actually a series of pots. When it got to be six feet, we trimmed the roots. It stayed six feet for five years. Then we moved. But that's... That's the, the thing. So, uh, you know, Deborah, my only concern is um, when I come across a plant like that, you've had a lot more experience than I have about just the root washing system in containers, um, is um, it, it does it create a lot more shock um, than letting it settle in and then trimming it? Um, or does it really matter? Um, well, I've never done the let it settle in and then trim because to me that then you're disrupting everything again. Again, yeah. Yeah. Um, again, when I've done root washing, I have I have removed as much as up to two thirds of the roots of something because they needed they were misshapen or something, mm -hmm. and had the plant bounce back fine. Now, given the more you re the more you remove, the, the more slowly it is going to recover and bounce back. Sure. 
but but the only thing I've ever killed was when I did the rhododendron and I basically blasted all the roots away because it they're just <laughs> suitable for root washing. That's how I learned that. Um, you know what? I did exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I hold it up and there's hardly, I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I probably should not have done that. Yes, but yes. seriously, you can, you'd be surprised how many of the roots you can cut away. It will recover more slowly, but if you're careful for a year, keep it watered, keep it mulched. I mean, even in a pot, you should, you should mulch, you should mulch the top of the soil yeah, in a yeah. pot in a container. That's, that's what I did today is I washed, uh, my dahlias or dahlias were in pots, washed all the soil off of them, have them to dry on the side. Uh, the last couple of years, I've just left them in the pots and just fertilized and maybe added some compost to the top. But dahlias, you can either leave them in the ground, providing you mulch them, mm -hmm. or you can dig them up and uh, bring them indoors, just the bulbs. I did the same thing with my cannas today as well mm -hmm. as uh, a few of those ones that I wanted to keep, like the anisette uh, banana. Mm -hmm. I did that today too. Uh, washed all the roots off, cut it, cut it off, and then it's just drying upside down. So the, the, it's something you can do with some of your, uh, your tender perennials if you want to overwinter them. Yeah, and I find I have a lot of things like oleanders, for instance, or also some of the angel trumpets that are lovely to start if um, is is a big plant early in the spring, but obviously they can't take any frost, so they have to come into the house. Well, the only place in the house is, in my case, my bedroom, and that's two flights of stairs up. So obviously, I can't put them into ever increasing pot sizes because I simply can't carry it. So I do exactly what Deborah suggests is uh, take them out of the pot, get them all cleaned up, trim them, and then they stay more or less a manageable size. And then I can set them out again early. Well, as soon as the frost is over in the spring works really well. So if you are in that predicament where you want to keep your favorite plants, but they have to come indoors, that's a good way to go. Also, uh, some uh, some of the those plants do divide, and it's a great time to divide them, right? Yep. Especially if you've got uh, a, um, a shrub that canes, right? If you want to divide it, or your dahlias, your any rhizomous plant. I see we have lots more questions, which is wonderful. Yes, someone is asking, um, which is the, uh, we were laughing earlier about the controversial leave the leaves, um, <laughs> whether uh, ginkgo leaves are good for composting and uh, uh, magnolia leaves, um, heard they are too waxy. Um, no, um, wax on the top of leaves is a protective mechanism. Um, everything rots, everything composts. The smaller the shape, the faster it composts. So if you have large waxy leaves, they will compost more slowly. And if you can chop those leaves by breaking the wax surface, you're allowing the composting process to move faster. And um, the finer that you can, um, cut them the better. So a lot of people use the lawnmower to, to mm -hmm. cut them up. Um, so ginkgo leaves, uh, rhododendron leaves, magnolia leaves, all just fine to compost. And the more variety of leaves you use, the better your compost will be. But having said that, I totally agree with you, Joe, with a couple mm -hmm. of exceptions. And the one is walnut leaves. And of course, chetna's leaves are almost in the same category as walnut leaves because they have a substance in it that actually inhibits plant growth. And so if you have a lot of walnut leaves um, that you mix in with your leaf mulch or um, that kind of stuff, then you really have that inhibiting factor from, from those leaves. So I would keep any walnut and horse chestnut leaves out of my leaf mix. Okay. The other thing that I do with leaves like that is I don't actually put them in my compost. I leave them on the ground where they fall. And That's I let them I dig them in. Yeah. To, um, 
uh, use as a, um, a surface mulch over the winter, keeps the protects the ground from the pounding rains and all that. And they eventually do break down and return to the soil. They may last a little longer that way than in a compost pile. But uh, when I was using, when I had a very large vegetable garden, um, the leaves were a really um, important addition um, to the compost because I would have too much greenery or, you know, wet green mm. without them. But now, like you, Deborah, I, I simply spread them on the ground and kind of give them a scratch in so I have a mix on top. And we have a giant sequoia tree um, that um, gives us um, multitudinous needles. And, and it's great because I just stir as many things in as I can into the top area and uh, it composts just fine. But then, I, as I say, I don't need that extra compost for my vegetable garden. So it, 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 I get to be lazy. Yeah, I use the leaves as a blanket. I use the leaves as a blanket uh, between yeah. my vegetables and also just, and I keep the whole leaves. The reason I do that is um, because if you shred them first, then they don't give that protective layer. It's it's almost like scales if you have the whole leaf. But if you shred them first, then you don't have that protective layer against the pelting rain. Um, but then in the spring, if I still have a lot of leaves, and I do put a lot on, if I still have a lot of intact leaves, then I run over it with a lawnmower and just leave them. And then pretty soon they're all gone. The other thing to consider um, with the leaves that have fallen is <clears throat> there, there may possibly, in fact, probably be eggs of beneficial insects in those leaves. And if you run them through your That's lawnmower, point. you're destroying all those, which is another reason that I, this time of year, I will go out in my yard and gently rake the leaves off the lawn into the flower beds. And that's all I do because I don't want to disturb all the beneficials that are in the leaves. Now, here's an interesting one. We just picked up a number of iris, uh, yellow iris tubers that someone had left by the roadside. What should we do with them? Should they be planted, stored, potted at this time? Well, well, Sabrina, yellow iris, do you know what kind of iris that is? Yeah. Because there is uh, a yellow iris that is an invasive species. And... Um, I, that would make me nervous right. if you if you know that it's a bearded iris, a Dutch iris, or an unbearded iris like a um, a Japanese bulb iris, um, and you just and they they've they've labeled it, it correctly, then I would keep it. Um, I if they just say yellow iris, I would get rid of it um, because I'm not sure. And I ain't so poor that I'm not going to have any irises for the rest of my life because I didn't get these ones. Um, I'd very much rather be safe than sorry. Oh, In oh, terms oh. of regular irises, um, yes, now's the time to put them into the ground. And always remember that iris is one of the few exceptions on burying your geophytes, your, your bulbs. They sit on the surface, they have a very long root and you keep the root down, but you keep the tuber just on the, just at the surface of the ground. I'm sorry, Deborah, you began to no, say. No, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna say, if you really want to find out what that iris is, because I had I had a yellow flag iris, the, the invasive one pop up in my yard years ago and didn't know what it was. And, and it got to be five feet tall and it had these big yellow flowers on it. It was a giant big plant. And I figured out what it was before it went to seed. And if you can just make sure and pick those seed pods off, it's not going to spread. That's but then a good as, point. as soon as you know that it's yellow flag iris, which is the invasive one, you can get rid of it. But you can actually grow it, let it bloom and figure out, use a plant identific identification app to figure out what it is. Cause it might be okay. The, the yellow flag iris is probably one of the smaller <clears throat> ones too. So you, you wouldn't actually be able to, you wouldn't say it's a regular iris by looking at it. It actually grows quite a bit taller. The flowers are up quite a ways. So it, it doesn't resemble yeah. any of the garden 
cultivars. Yeah, the Good leaves point. are different. The bottom, I mean, it's five, yeah. mine was five feet tall. It was, wow. it was enormous. I was, uh -huh. wow. yeah. So, but as long as you make sure that you destroy the seed pods, you know, you can experiment and see what it is, I think, and then pull the plant out. <laughs> Hey, we have a question from Wendy Young. When's a good time to rework an overground perennial border? And how would you go about it? Now? Now, definitely. <laughs> Yesterday. Divide it. <laughs> well, the, and the, don't don't try to do it all at once. If it really <laughs> is a mature perennial border, it's going to take you a while. Yeah. And... Um, do some planning. Actually, if there was something in your border before that you didn't like, well, now's the time to change it if you're going to do something. Yeah. Also, you might want in a, in a border, a narrow border, you might want to put some taller ones in the back and maybe some shorter ones up front. So it gives you a sense of uh, height and a little bit of sense of depth. And, and take a good look at the plants themselves. Um, are they healthy? Um, are they congested in itself? In other words, does it need cleaning out? Does it need separating? Mark those, make notes. And then you can go about those changes. As Richard said, don't like that, plant sale. Um, yeah. And um, give yourself some room. And a true perennial border is always going to get overgrown. Mm -hmm. So as you refurbish it, make it look too bare. Yes. Um, don't have mm -hmm. it all full together because you're going to be making the same fight next year. You know, you make want it very, very bare. Make those perennials your specimen plants, and put small things in 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 between them, and then let them grow out. Annuals. Put in annuals. Put in. Um, plants that are going to stay small, all those things. And that way you can change your bed bit by bit and not ever really get completely overgrown at any given time. Well, the other thing is, let's say if you've had something that has mildew on it all the time, well, then you know that it's not the right place for it, right? Yeah. So change it. Put it, look at your land and just decide, is it a dry corner or is it a wet corner? How much light does it get? And then do your homework, read uh, the perennials that, what the perennials like to grow in. So yes, Joe made, jo made an interesting comment in terms of plant sales. Um, do divide them and sort of store those plants that you no longer want or that are excess to your needs and give them to the nearest charity that's having a plant sale. There's so many outfits that love to have those plants and raise money for whatever good cause they're going for. So so don't just throw them away. Um, just remember to label them. them. Yeah, label oh, thank them. you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. remember to label them. Also color-wise and height-wise. Um, and I'd like to leave you with a little thought about... Um, planting your garden about planting your garden the mistake people make is they almost always plant perennials too close together yep. and annuals too far apart so if you yeah. keep that in your mind when you're doing your planting if you feel like you want these perennials this far apart put them this far apart instead because they will grow in and take up the space now your annuals which only have one season to mature and grow you need to plant those closer together otherwise they're going to be all spotty with spaces between them that has helped me a lot over the years when you first plant a new bed it should look bare the first year or the first or the first couple of years it should look bare which is your cue to so, buy lots of neat statues you know well or fill in with annuals but but yeah. if you plant all those perennials like you'd like them to look immediately in three years it's going to be overgrown and you're going to be ripping them out so oh yeah yeah we have a question from nicola what should I do with my raspberries that are growing very tall? Raspberries do that, you know, um, and that's okay. That means that they're very healthy. The key to raspberries, cane fruit, is to remember they grow the first year, they fruit the second year. So what you would be doing with your raspberries right now is that everything that had fruit on it this year is kaputski, okay? Just like 
send it to the great compost bin in the sky, cut those down and leave room for the ones that grew this year and didn't fruit to fruit next year. So and, corn, uh, just kind of wondering, there are some uh, raspberry cultivars that don't grow as tall. If it's mm -hmm. a problem getting to the top of them uh, where the fruit is, then maybe choose uh, a cultivar that is lower growing. And there are all kinds of cultivars of, of raspberries. You, you can also take those really long canes that are, you know, seven, eight, 10 feet long, and you can cut them to about three feet. And then the buds below where you cut, they will all sprout and it'll, yeah. it'll do this and it won't be too tall. That's what I do every year. So I, that's interesting because I always took my, I had uh, uh, inherited, you know, uh, uh, in one garden, a very tall cultivar and I was nervous about pruning them back. And I just took the tops because I had wires and just bent them over the wires at the height that it was easy to pick them at. And, uh, and then of course they got cut out that, uh, that year anyway, yeah. but um, thanks for that. I did not realize that I would get as many pruning canes down below. So we have a question from Wendy Young. There are so many conflicting views on storing dahlias over the winter. What are the panelists suggestions? Well, her suggestion done, is go to the VIR webpage and our dahlia expert, Gwen Redcliffe, has a mm -hmm. whole session on how to take care of dahlias. So there, there are a few ways you can leave them in the ground as well as they're as long as they're well mulched and in a very free flowing soil. Uh, you can leave them in a pot and let the pot, uh, cut all the top leaves off or the stems and put them in a storm in a cool garage or something. Or you can do what I did today is wash, uh, empty the, the pot on the ground and wash all the soil away and then dry them out and store them dry. So there's various ways. A lot uh, of people like storing them in little bags with uh, some hamster um right. whatever that's called chips bedding you know, hamster litter bedding. Bedding. yeah yeah bedding that's the word i was looking for and that seems to go very well i had the friend who was a prize winning dahlia grower and that's how he did it he dug them up cleaned them up and then just kept one of the best tubers from that particular one or more from that particular uh well the other thing litter. is and in, in a bag, and then in the next spring, in they went, and he had the most marvelous garden. Or you can sell them to your, uh, give them to your friends, or sell plant them. Plant sales, you name it. Yeah, plant sales. Mm -hmm. the same thing is same thing with uh, cannas or callas. You can dig them up and store them dry, or you can leave them in the pot, whichever mm -hmm. you want. Okay, so we have another question here about whether to leave something in a pot. She says... She uh, Linda Mooney says, I have anemones in pots. Should I bring them in? I've left mine out in pots. What kind I'm of anemones? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so many different anemones. Yeah. I mean, the anemone blanda is is uh, uh, quite hardy. It's zone five to eight. But there are some that are tender. And it wouldn't it, Dorothy, really depend on first of all what kind it is, but also how long they've had them in the pot, and uh, is the pot crowded? It, it's we would kind of need a bit more information there. We have another question, and that is: Do you think it's safe to use the chop and drop method with tomato plants, which don't appear to have verdicillium wilt? I personally think that's high risk. Yeah. I, I I personally agree. take all my tomato greens. And if I were to have a really hot compost, which I don't, but if I were to have a very hot compost, I might put them into my compost. But as it is, tomatoes, I must say, I put into the city um, composting bins or where they go to landfill because I just don't feel that it's safe to do that um, because sometimes you can't even see, especially towards the end of the season, you can't really see what the, whether there's any wilt or, or any uh, thing that might give you some grief. So I would tend to not 
do the chop and chop with uh, chop and drop with tomato plants. I don't know what the rest of you think. I know in um, RDN, the RDN will allow you to put that in your green waste. So Oh yes, absolutely. I, that's what I've done. Yeah, because That there way, you it's know really it's going to be a hot compost on the other end. So you're not going to worry about uh, bringing in uh, pests and diseases or whatever. And we are we are so lucky um, now that we have really good green green waste collection because we don't have to make those risky choices, uh, and that's you know that's kind of Uh, kind of nice, but I, I quite agree. Um, if you're not sure, unless you are out there with the compost thermometer and know that things are absolutely hot enough, be just make, take the safe choice. <laughs> okay, so we have a question. What are your thoughts on planting fall winter rice seeds on vegetable beds over the winter? Uh, you would do that for a cover crop. which is going to improve the soil. Um, what I've read about that, I've not done it, but what I've read about that that says it's, it's a little bit impractical for a home gardener unless you have a really large vegetable garden. Using cover crops is something done in commercial agriculture to improve soil. I don't think there's any harm in it. I think it's probably a lot of work because you have to Um, do something about this in the spring, all this greenery and turn it or churn it in or whatever. I think there might be better ways to improve your soil than cover crops. But on the other hand, I don't, it's not a bad thing. I don't think it would hurt. My own experience, my own experience in my not terribly big garden, but a reasonable size garden, I've tried it and, and it was a nice um, greenery in the spring. The problem is if you don't get to it in a reasonable fashion, if they get too tall, a little bit of green from the growing tip sticks up, it's more like a weed than anything else. So It has I've a got very to wait. vigorous, yeah, it's a grass. It has a vigorous It's a grass, root system. exactly. Yeah. And and so Yeah. it becomes a bit weedy. And so I've gotten away from using um, fall rye or anything like that as a cover crop and rather mulch really heavily, primarily with leaves. And that I think it does the same thing in terms of soil composition and uh, health and all this kind of good stuff. So that's my preference. You, you And also I, have I to have be careful. a I have a friend who has one section of his vegetable garden that is subject to a lot of erosion, just the way the wind hits it and the rain hits it. And he will put a cover crop, cover crop there to help hold the soil along with winter mulch. But then he's he's quite religious about getting out there early and 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 digging it in. Um, because as he said, he he learned his lesson the hard way leaving it too long. Well, But you have to my be really experience careful. has been much the same as yours, Yeah. Dorothy. But you have to be really careful not to let it go to seed either, or you're Right. going to have, you're going to have a, you know, a constant crop of this stuff. So, Yes. yeah. 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 I think all in all, I think it might be more work than it's worth in a small master, uh, uh, Yeah. vegetable garden. The Yeah. next question is actually kind of similar, and it says, I have a small raised bed. What should I do right now? Fall rye, compost, manure, more soil, plant garlic. What else can I plant right now? Well, you can kind of do a cover crop. And so if you like um, broad beans, for instance, broad beans are uh, the, the cheap broad beans are actually used as a cover crop and people till them in. The, the better broad beans that are meant for direct eating are have all the same advantages. You could plant them now. Um, and then they come out in the spring and then it's an absolutely wonderful vegetable, assuming you like that kind of fresh lima bean or fresh um, broad bean, that absolutely wonderful. And then you leave the roots in once, once you're done with um, harvesting the beans, once you're done, you leave the roots in, just cut off the greenery, compost the greenery, wonderful. You've had nice meals and you've improved your soil. Um, And also, of course, if, go ahead, Joe. also in terms of what else do I do with the ground? Um, if you're not going to plant garlic or broad beans, which is really the only thing you're going to plant in terms of food crops this late in the year, um, don't waste your time and money with the manure and the fertilizer. It used to be 
Um, give your bed, your garden beds, uh, a good feed to put them to, to bed for the winter. No, you're just, you're wasting it. Mulch and leave it and protect the soil. We get a lot of rain. The time to add your manure and your other amendments is in the early spring. So don't make more work for yourself unless you have a passion uh, for broad beans the way that Dorothy and I have, uh, or you want to grow garlic. Because garlic is also something that gives you two crops, um, the scapes and then the bulb. But don't, don't be digging in the manure and all like that. Just mulch it. So we just had a follow-up from uh, Sabina. Oh dear, no idea. That's all it said. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, that advice, I'll get rid of them. And then uh, Nicole is also saying, uh, is it too late to dig up irises to separate them? Ah, huh. that, uh, hmm. I don't think if you really need to divide them and dig them up, then do it. If you don't, then don't. Um, if the if the clump was terribly crowded uh, and unhealthy, I would and they tend to you'll find that they will end up growing over each other, then lift those ones off and either store them or plant them. But um, with iris, um, yes, they're hardy. Yes, you can do it. Um, and well, the other thing is, I never, I never did. I waited till spring to divide them. I treated them like a perennial. Yeah, those Japanese uh, irises, way they they grow in a clump and then they grow wider, but then the center dies it's, out in them. Right. So then that's a good time to to divide them. And yeah. if they've been in the ground about three, maybe four years it would be time to do it, I would say. And, and just remember, irises are tough. I mean, oh, yeah. there's yeah. not a lot you can do to kill them. <laughs> you can divide them whenever, as long as they've got adequate water and light, they're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So do it when it works for you. Yeah, you can... I, I like that. Do it when it works for you. That's my kind of gardening. <laughs> I'm very pragmatic about those kind of things. Many things like the pruning and whatnot. Do it when you actually have time. I mean, there's there's some rules that one shouldn't right. step over too easily, but overall, when you have time, is a good time to do it. Actually, with irises, any time from I think August because they're all done blooming until probably early spring when they're ready to start growing again. Any time during that is just yeah when it works for you. No, oh, here's here's one from Maria. I have a tree that's being choked out by English ivy. Ah. Well, I watched English ivy kill a 200 foot uh, um, thuja, um, red cedar, cut it right out at the ground, grab those roots and rip them all out. The stuff in the bark will die, that's fine. But be aggressive with it and, and don't give up. Um, it's a horrible noxious weed. And um, it's very dangerous in the forest. As I say, I watched over a period of oh, four years, maybe, watched it kill a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, don't don't be don't be shy. Be mean. When you're angry at the world, go out and kill the English ivy. You'll feel better. The world will feel better. And whoever you're angry at will be thankful that you didn't yell at them. But you, you can't use. You can't use chemicals on it because it's wrapped around, it's at the base of a tree already. So then you're the tree's at risk. What you're doing sounds to me like really all you can do, you just have to keep doing it. Yeah. But a friend of mine had very good luck by uh, actually attaching, I, I think, a chain um, to some of the bigger roots and okay. actually pulling it out with her car. And a lot of the roots came out and it didn't seem to do any damage to the tree that it was trying to uh, climb up on. But so it was a huge task. We did miss a question from Sue. Yes. Mm. Uh, if you put straw in your beds over winter, what should you do when tidying up in the spring? Dig it in, compost, other things? I think you should tackle this one, Dorothy. You're, you're the vegetable. Sure. Um, personally, I would do nothing. 
Um, I would leave the straw exactly where it is. If I wanted to plant something, then I would just shove the straw aside a little bit, dig in my new transplant or my seed row, but I would leave the straw exactly where it is and uh, except, as I say, where I wanted to actually plant something. And then, and then it'll decompose over time, but it'll give you lovely mulch that you don't have to add to or add only a little bit to. So just make room for the plants that you want to put in and leave it. It might not look as tidy and whatnot, but it certainly is excellent for the soil and it'll slowly decompose. The worms will help you as they come up and chew through it. And, uh, and you have the mulch right there. So why bother to do anything else? Nature. And the less you Wonderful. disturb the soil, the better. That's that's the point. I think that's the other. Th that's yeah. exactly it. Let let nature do the disturbing by moving the the beneficial insects, the bacteria, the worms, and all this kind of stuff. They'll dig it in for you. We have somebody from anonymous. Any particular care you recommend for peonies leading up to winter? What peonies? There's uh, three different types basically there's a herbaceous the uh, tree peony or shrub peony and then there's the itol which is the hybrid between the two and uh, the treatment for a regular peony is just cut it down you know to you the have to cut basically. it down though you have to cut it down i leave mine i just leave it's just, mine late just a little unsightly it's yeah unsightly that, that's more the old, than that's, anything. Yeah. The but other i thing, i do the chop and drop in late winter and then okay. just well, then chop it and good. leave it. Yeah. I like to leave the stems, the hollow stems for um, cavity nesting insects, beneficials. Like but, grasses and stuff would do well with that too. Some of the yeah. uh, bigger grasses. But, and then the uh, Ito, I would just leave them because mm -hmm. at times uh, for me, they'd come back from uh, the, yeah. the growth. The base. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. not from the base, right from the, the branch. Oh, from the top. Yeah. I've never grown them, so I, I'm not familiar with the... And then the tree peony, well, I learned the hard way that you should really prune it because it's either that or you end up with one shoot going straight up <laughs> and then a little couple of branches. And then this year, actually, I cut it and I've got like five or six branches when there was only one before. Yeah. So you know, it depends. I, I'm a great um, proponent of chop and drop for most herbaceous perennials, but I also yes. leave most of mine until late winter. And I know it doesn't look nice. And some of them, you know, you can clean them up. I'm a little more fussy in my front yard where people can see it. In my backyard, I just leave it all because the critters, mm -hmm. the beneficial critters, yeah. I think they really depend on that stuff. So I, I like to not disturb it very much. But that's that's going to be a determination that you're going to make in your own garden, how you want to do that. But mm -hmm. chop and drop is great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I quite agree. I, you know, nature's, na that... Mother Nature's been doing it for long enough that I think maybe I'll just, like, trust her. <laughs> there are some perennials that actually, if you leave the seed heads on it, you're feeding the birds, you're feeding some of the critters and stuff like that. So, you know, like Rebecca or uh, uh, purple cone flower, echinacea, leave the crocosmia, yeah, crocosmia, any of those. And with cro crocosmia, sometimes you might even get the seeds germinating, and then you just end up with more of them rather than oh. actually having them uh, travel underground. Mm -hmm. my, my my echinaceas, I have three echinacea plants in my front yard, and I have upwards of 75 babies every spring. Wow. It They just seed like crazy everywhere. So just leave those things there and you'll have babies galore. And then I pot them up for the plant sale. So okay, we have uh, Wendy. Perennial border is okay to put the plants in pots or should they put in spare soil elsewhere over winter? Oh, oh, yeah. She was asking us about generally cleaning it right. up earlier. Yeah. yeah. What um, I what I do is if I know that I'm going to get rid of that plant, but it's a plant that I know is good at a sale, as long as I have a pot, I pot it up and store it for the winter. If I have room in the soil and I'm going to keep it, then yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the soil. I tend to more and more pot them up 
because they're easier to handle. I've handled them once. I've gotten them the root ball healthy. I know everything is fine. I store it in a pot. And then whatever I decide to do in spring, I already have more than half of my work done. The other thing is you have to be very careful because leaving it in a pot, you've automatically lowered your zone by two to two zones. Well, like if you're an point. 8B, you'd be a 7B, a 6B. And sometimes plants, perennials, are not hardy in a pot. So if you put them somewhere under cover or close to the house where you can protect them, then that might be the best idea. Just be careful. I've lost, lost uh, Procrosmia, and they're hardy. But they were in a pot. That was last winter because of the, the cold winter we had. Good. Right? That's so a really good point, Richard. Yeah. The other thing about anything you're going to put in a pot and then even and then pull under cover, like under a covered patio or some, something for the winter, you need to be careful to check the moisture level. Yeah. I have lost things because I didn't check the moisture and they completely dried out. And then you get a cold, a cold snap. And if there's no moisture in the soil, the roots will actually freeze. If there's moisture in the soil, it's not going to get much colder than just freezing, the freezing point. But mm -hmm. if it's 10, minus 10 out there and there's no moisture in that soil, your roots are exposed to minus 10 temperature and they will freeze. Yeah. So you have to make sure those things in pots stay watered. Not soaking wet, but not dry out either. So we have a question from Jennifer. One of my hellebores is already pushing out flower buds. I noticed a week ago or so hiding under the leaves. Today they've grown about an inch and they're showing more of the color. Is it too early? Should I leave them? Leave them. Of course, leave them. I mean, we are so desperate for flowers this time of the year yeah. when everything else has gone back. Of course you should leave them and enjoy them. And you know, hellebore is really quite hardy. You know, you'd have to get really, really cold to, you know, destroy the flower. I've had them at minus 10, and then the next day, it's like just above zero, and they're all back smiling. They're smiling faces based on the sun. It, it feels wrong to have them bloom so early, but there's really, there's really nothing you can do about it. Really. I've, got, I've had rhododendrons flowering the second time, and that was only a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes we forget that... Um, unless the plant has been terribly stressed and it's flowering in response to that, if you've got something flowering, it's because the plant is actually just fine. It grows, it sets its seed, it flowers, it goes dormant. It, it knows what to do. And if it's decided it's okay to bloom, then go out and enjoy it. And, oh, and be sure to, to, to talk to all the people back East Oh, and yeah. in Take Saskatchewan and Globe, send pictures, you know, um, that's, you know, if we have to put up with the rain, we get to gloat about the flowers. True enough. Uh, okay. Wendy has a question. How high should I put the straw mulch for the winter? Several inches. Yeah. Yeah, several inches. Two, two inches is nice and more is okay. I wouldn't bother because you have to pay for the straw after all. But it does insulate the ground too, doesn't it? Because yeah, but two, two inches air. is good. Yeah. Well, the main thing I think for a vegetable bed or something in the winter, for bare soil in the winter is to protect from the pounding rains mm -hmm. because that, that just compresses the soil the pack with it and it washes things out. So mulch is just, is just so helpful for that. So Okay, we have a question about cane fruit. What do I do with a domestic blackberry at this time of year? Well, again, it's a cane fruit. Um, it responds to, uh, as all the cane fruit, your blackberry, your raspberry, um, uh, it grows and then it fruits. So again, if it has fruited, that cane is done. You go, you go back to your prima canes. Those are the ones that will fruit next year. So um, I would cut out the ones that are finished. And, uh, oh, and by the way, if they're still a little green, I, I use them to make baskets. 
right? They make great baskets. Um, you just wear well, gloves and take off the thistle and nice too, you know, for Christmas. It, uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, um, and then just tie the others up um, on your wires uh, or if they're freestanding, fine. I always provide, have mm -hmm. provided wires for my cane fruit. Um, it just makes them easier to manage and you can get in close to pick. Uh, and that's that's what you do with them. It's so, uh, easy peasy. The other thing is there are some domestic blackberries that are yeah. thornless. Oh, so, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so that's always nice to grow that in your yard and not have to worry about the brambles. Yeah. Fighting that. I, I have a thornless loganberry in my oh. in that I grow that I love, love, love. In my previous house, I had thornless boysenberries, which were nice. also wonderful. I uh, Both of them, I think, have much more flavor than the blackberries. So I, I prefer them, but. Mm. Yeah. Question from Kathy. I hear, I heard two different opinions about adding compost to vegetable beds, not in the winter as nutrients will be washed away or add now to act as mulch. Mm. Compost is gold and it's so valuable. If I can add mulch and let it break down slowly, I I never ever had enough compost. I mean, I had 400 square feet of vegetables. I was scrambling to get compost. Um, save it, it's fine. Um, mulch it now this time of year, add your compost in spring. What, what do you do, um, Dorothy, with your huge guys? Do you use a lot of compost in, in autumn? Never, never. I, I mulch heavily, heavily with leaves. Straw is wonderful. I just don't, if I have leaves, why buy a straw? Um, yeah. And then and then put whatever compost I can manage to make um, in the spring when it does me the most good. Mm. I do the same thing with my raised beds. I do add the compost in the spring. Mm. And it actually adds a layer of insulation too on the soil, which is always good. Great. Now, Lauren's asking about her rosemary plant and something that people don't realize about rosemary. Almost all our herbs are very, uh, are hardy in this area. Rosemary looks hardy. It looks like a little um, tree, right? It's actually the most tender of our perennial herbs. And the upright type of rosemary is more hardy than the Frosty. lower bushier one and um i've had rosemary that lasted for years and then a, a real hard a real hard uh, frost came and and killed it off what i always do with my rosemary is that i um give it a give it a high donut of mulch around the roots and I make sure there's good drainage. It will die from wet. And um, as Richard was talking about um, earlier, about something um, getting ice around its, around its roots. And the other thing that I do is that I, um, I always keep an old tomato cage, which I don't use for tomatoes uh, anymore, um, but those, that cage, either a peony cage or a tomato cage, and I put it around the rosemary and I put a wrap of remay, of row cover around it. Rosemary will get desiccated very easily. And again, we don't think about it because it looks green and healthy. And by doing that, I, I stopped losing my rosemary completely. And I, I had it all winter. Um, I'm also and, wondering uh, with Lauren, how far she is away from the water. Is she up on the, a mountainside or is she closer? Is it in a pot or not in a pot? Mm -hmm. Is it in wet ground? Is it got good drainage? You know, right. These are all questions. Yeah. And, and the, bay, questions. the bay is much the same as the rosemary. Yeah. It's they're actually um, zone zone seven B is really the most that they can handle. And um, unless you're on a full zone eight, you're going to have to take care of these plants over winter, particularly if we get snow, because our snow is wet and it sits mm -hmm. right on the plant 
and it knocks it down. And if you've got them in pots, remember, then that you have to go down mm -hmm. the stones. Because yeah. I've, yeah. I've lost both rosemary and bay. Um, I find with the rosemary, for me, it was more about wet soil in the winter. And if yes. I, my rosemary does better mm -hmm. in a pot because it, it drains better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I they're... They're a Mediterranean plant. They're not meant to be in wet soil all the time. So, mm. yeah. And they mm -hmm. really like full sun yes. for both yes. the bay tree and the rosemary. Full sun. And otherwise, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be a bit touch and go. Mm -hmm. well, you could plant it in a, sort of a, a, an area where it's protected. So let's say if you got it up against a house or something on the south or west side, something like that, you know, they would last a little bit or it wouldn't be quite as prone to dying every year. Yeah, yeah, but it really is only half uh, half hardy. Uh, yeah. and... Okay, we have a question from Linda. It's a bag of assorted anemones. I we still have a few so. others before that. I think we've done yeah. it, we've Dorothy. We yeah. did the hellebores and the... No, no, have we done the one-year-old fig tree? No, they no. never was before the we fig tree. We were actually up. Uh, Linda Mooney, actually, just... Uh, it's a bag of assorted anemones. Mm. If we were not in zone seven, oh, sorry. should they be dug up? <laughs> that depends on... It, it depends on if you want to do that or not. Like... I just mulch them very heavily. Yeah, yeah, if you mulch, and if you're willing to maybe have some loss, you know, and mm -hmm. exp experiment in your own garden as well. I don't have a lot of patience for things that are fussy and need to be dug up every year and then replanted. I uh, I, I know, <laughs> and I'm I'm I I think I'm just too lazy for that. So if it needs to be dug up every single year and then special treatment and then planted again, I tend not to grow it. So you kind of need to decide how much work you want to do. Maybe leave some of them in the ground and see how they do. Dig some up and save them and see what, if that amount of work works for you. Um, you know, gardening is experimenting, I think. So I don't know. What, what, what would you guys say on that one? Oh, I, I quite agree. Generally, um, bulbs are happiest if you leave them. And then if they're going to, they're going to live. They're really going to do well. Uh, and so if they were healthy this year and they're not crowded, mulch them if your zone area is marginal and um, say goodnight to them for the winter and welcome them in the spring. Yeah. If you haven't figured it out by now, mulch is magic. <laughs> mulch, mulch, mulch is magic. Oh, my God. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, okay next Pauline. we have any plant not flowering uh, mm -hmm. and full sun. Is it too deep, too old? Uh, too deep absolutely could be why they're not flowering. Peony are very fussy about the depth. The other thing is if you move a peony, it will sometimes sulk for a year or two before it'll bloom again. Uh, so, But if it's been there a while and hasn't bloomed, I would check and see if it's too deep. Because well, it's that old adage, sleep, creep, leap. Even yeah. when, you, when you're transplanting yeah. or you're cutting them. Yeah. Daphne is another one that sulks when you fuss with it in any way. So, um, but yeah, it, it most likely is too deep, I think. Okay. Sabina has that question on figs. How can well, I get a one-year-old fig, brown turkey? My, my experience of figs is uh, the brown turkey. Um, now, I know you grow the um, desert king, don't you? Um uh, Dorsey, I always. I also brown. have a. I also have a brown turkey. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I found that the brown turkey was was quite hardy, and um, as a matter of fact, I I got one from a garden center because it was in a gallon pot and was frozen solid over winter, and I was <laughs> wandering around in February and the pots were talk talk talk. I said, "Oh, I'll take this one." He said, "God, we're not even selling that." I said, "Yeah." I'll give you five bucks for it. And then he said, why? And I says, it has two leaves and it froze over winter in a gallon pot. Do you think that it might be hardy? And so <laughs> bless his heart, he sold it to me for five bucks. 
And then I came back about two months later and he had taken all the other ones and grown them out and sold them for 45. And they were all beautiful. You know, he was an honest man. He sold sold it to me for five bucks. And <laughs> that's very, very lovely. But very if you're really worried, propagate. if you're really worried, you could uh, always wrap it in a bit of remake for the first yeah. winter. But the real thing is make sure the drainage is good where you've planted it. Make sure that um, it's nicely staked, at least initially, and uh, and then mulch it heavily, and you should be just fine. Oh, yeah. 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 They're, they're, that. they're pretty tough. Violette de Bordeaux. It's actually a, a purple sort of a colored fruit. Lovely. Really sweet, but not as large as the uh, brown turkey or a desert mm. king. Oh, okay. Hey. Next question. My rose has very long stalks, 12 to 15 feet. Didn't bloom this year. Shall I cut the whole thing down to about three feet and when? Hmm. April is going to answer this question live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The uh, rule of thumb in terms of phenology is you um, prune your roses when the forsythia is in bloom. Mm -hmm. So late winter, very early spring. If it didn't bloom, whether it's uh, now, is it a um, climber or a rambler? That's yes. that's your primary concern. It, I would say if it grew 12 to 15 feet, it's a climber. I had rambler that rambler. that mm -hmm. that grew 10 feet a year. Yes, um, I have one doing that in my yard this year. Yeah. And I cut it completely to the ground in the spring because it looked like it had some disease. And I had zero flowers. So if you cut it back too far, you won't have any flowers. Right. The with the the um with the climber, um, when you look at the plant itself, the climber is is almost self-supporting. It has it has a good strong base. Your uh rambler is is more willowy and feathery. Okay. So if it didn't bloom and it's very tall, my question becomes, what did you do with it last year? Or is it happy in that space? Or is it happy in that space? Because I know people people have come to me and said, oh, I've got this big giant rose and all I've got is a little bit of stuff on top. You need to you need to be cutting it down and 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 getting it getting it restructured. Um, uh, was just saying that she cuts hers in the fall. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'm I'm sure that that it I'm sure that works. I was just um uh I was always told to cut it in the spring and so I've never I've never tried cutting them in the fall. Hey, we have a question from Stephanie. Our garlic bed is very wet and muddy right now which I assume will not support good growth. What do I do if the bed doesn't dry out, especially in the light of recent torrential rains? Wait to plant in the spring? Uh, um, I, I always plant my garlic in mid-October, kind of before the rains start and before everything's mutt and wetty. Mutt and wetty. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's a wet spot. Mulch pretty, pretty deeply and then let it mm -hmm. rain. As yeah. I, I don't By know the what... sounds of it, it sounds like it's pretty wet uh, in a wet area. So I would say, you know, maybe in a raised bed might be better. You know, yep. chances are it would rot if it's really wet. Oh, it'll rot if it's if it's sitting. Um, you should be rotating to different areas anyway with yeah. garlic. Yeah, especially with any of the alliums. I wouldn't be planting them in the same bed every year. That's no, for sure. or chives or garlic or leeks, any of that is the allium rust. Uh, mm -hmm. It well, is in this it, area and yeah. it, it it's okay until it becomes it an infestation. The size of the bulb, so is what yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it is a garlic bed that you've used before and you're finding it very wet, then um make it work to your advantage um dig a couple of drainage trenches uh to help drain the bed mulch it and let it lie fallow as richard says 
with the with the rust, you don't want to be planting all the time in the same place. Something I used to do with my garlic, um, because I never had enough room, uh, was that I tucked it into my perennial beds here and there and, you know, wherever there was spots. Uh, mm. And because I did have uh, some allium rust, that really took care of a lot of the allium rust because they were spread in different areas. And when you have um, a particular cultivar that is subject to a certain type of disease or pests, um, spreading it out is one of the best things you can do because disease um, on pests uh, have a limit to how fast they're going to travel. And um, that's what I would do if that was my garlic bed. I know, you know there's I, I do some... the same thing. I do the same thing with potatoes, Joe. I plant do my you? potatoes. I tuck them in in my perennial beds. Yeah. Nice. Well, and they they're pretty flowers anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from James. This was my first year growing globe artichokes. They did mm. very well. I wanted to try overwinter them. I cut them back to the ground, mulched with six inches of dry straw, tinted with a piece of thin cardboard, tinted with a piece of fine mm. cardboard. I have gone over barred. <laughs> Could you foresee anything going wrong with this method? Well, I don't think you need to tent them. No. With the with the cardboard. Mulching them is fine. If yeah, they did they, well and produced well this year, that tells you that it's in a good spot, that they have enough sun and they have enough drainage. So bravo. It's uh, a perennial also. Uh, yeah. So and just just cutting year. them down and mulching them is the thing to do. And, and I'd like to throw in a little caution here against using cardboard in your garden. Yes. Uh, uh, there's been recent research that says most cardboard has forever chemicals in it, PFAs, mm -hmm. and that those are going to get into your soil and they're going to get into our water systems. And these are really bad. Uh, the other thing is if you're going to use cardboard as mulch of any kind to lay it on the soil, you're interfering with air and gas exchange at the surface and you are really stressing and maybe even killing your soil microbiome underneath. Uh, mm -hmm. Cardboard just does not belong in your garden. Here's so. a question for Dorothy. Follow up about let, uh, you did your last year, you did your uh, winter veggies. Right. So the question is, can I plant Cassandra lettuce seeds from Salt Spring Seeds now or is it too late? Well, I think it's a bit late. Possibly if they're quite hardy, you could have started them um, in seed trays maybe a month ago, preferably two months ago, and then put out the, the little plants. And if you have a very protected area or better yet, like an unheated greenhouse or a bit of a um, some kind okay. of cover, a dome over it, then I think they would do well. But now to start from seed, I think that is not a particularly good idea. What I would do is I would keep my seeds until probably in February sometime and mm -hmm. then seed them. And then as soon as uh, it's at all reasonable, set them out. And then at least you can have some early lettuce. But to think that you can still germinate them and get any crop out of them, I think that's uh, unduly optimistic. So not enough light and the soil's too cold. Yeah, way too cold for they germinate. Just germinate. Yeah. We yeah. have a question yeah. from Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, what's the risk of botrytis with a perennial or uh, hibiscus perennials? I thought that's why you were supposed to cut the branches off in the fall. Mm. Um, doesn't botrytis only grow in living tissue? Am I wrong? That, about that? that was my understanding. And yeah. um I think once this goes dormant, the, the, tissue, the, the plant is dying back. It's no longer a host yeah. for botrytis. Yeah. If the plant had botrytis, yeah, you're, that that's way. completely different. Right. But it's not going to get it. Right. But it's not going to get it now if it didn't have it. If, if, you had the, if you had the botrytis on that plant, then yes, it's infected. Yeah. And so anything you cut off, you would you would compost. Um, Hot compost. There, there was the old there was the old idea that 
that if anything was diseased, you never put it in your compost. Um, when your compost heats up, it kills stuff off. And um, it one type of plant disease doesn't transfer to another. It's not like COVID, you know. Um, and uh, um, that's the... That's the thing with the with the peony. Um, any other ideas on that, Richard? I I've not really had much problem with botrytis on my peonies. I think uh, if you do your due diligence and you see it on the plant, then chances are it's going to be on the plant next year. So I would dig it up and maybe get rid of it, you know, and uh, send it to the not the landfill, but uh, the um, green compost. Compost thing. Yeah. 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 So we have an anonymous potted fig on the balcony. Wait until all the leaves fall off before putting them in the shed. Leave them where they are. Wonder as they still have green leaves, but might the roots freeze in pots? Will the leaves fall before the roots freeze? Yeah. <laughs> the, the leaves will fall before the roots freeze. Yes. Yeah, and remember if the soil is 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 damp, that is going to protect the roots from actually freezing. I mean, that's a weird thing, but yeah. when you have when you have water freezes at at zero and if the air temperature drops, the frozen water, the ice does not get any colder. It stays at zero. So the moisture in your soil freezes stays at zero, air temperature is minus 10, that's, that frozen moisture in the pot is protecting mm -hmm. your roots. Because the other thing is and again, if you're concerned about the, the fig trees um, and that they're on a balcony, um, again, you can wrap them. The other thing you can do is that if you have a larger pot, you can put the smaller pot in the larger pot and that airspace uh, oh. Particularly on a balcony, if where you don't have a lot of wind, that provides um, protection as well. Just if yeah. you've got a cement on the on the bottom, if you've got something cold and rock um, where they're sitting, mm -hmm. it's better to lift them up a little bit. And sometimes that larger protection pot will do the same thing. The other thing is, if it's under cover, under a balcony, you've already raised your zone by at least one, yeah. one zone. Yeah. So if you're- And, yeah. and he has a shed. So he yeah. says, um, before putting them in the shed. So seeing he has the shed, I would just do it when it's convenient and have it over with and then bring them out again in the spring when the danger of frost is primarily gone. Figs are reasonably hardy anyway. Yeah. yeah, and like yeah. I said, if if it's under cover, chances are it's a couple of zones higher anyway. Yeah. If there's a patio door there, or you know, mm -hmm. normally there would be a patio yeah. door on a balcony yeah. and things. And, and as and as and as Deborah says, just don't let them get too dry. Yeah, no. just keep them very lightly moist for the winter. Yep. And and I'm the being the lazy gardener. I would wait till all the leaves fall, so then I don't have leaf mess. Have to pick it up. <laughs> When should I prune yes. my grapevines? Hmm. Uh, spring. Prune them in the summer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the now. spring. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I at the at the Bevan Learning Gardens, <clears throat> we have quite a number of grapevines, and we do them in about February. And when I've traveled in Europe, <clears throat> where they have extensive vineyards, I mean here too, I'm sure this is the same thing. I just happened to be there. Um, February, March is an excellent time to prune the grapes, and I usually count on leaving ten buds from the main stem. So as I get my um, side branch, of course they're tr assuming they're trellised. As I get my side branch, um, then I leave ten buds and cut off the rest. Right. But I, th I think if you're pruning for fruit, wouldn't you actually cut the the uh, branch short so it actually doesn't produce a lot of green growth and produces fruit instead? You you could. It kind of depends on, on your uh, way to go. I mean, I've seen beautiful winter vineyards in Europe where they actually grow them in a heart shape. So they take last year's nice. growth 
and they make a little heart shape out of it. And that's usually about eight to 10 buds in that last year's growth. Nice. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what do I do to protect blueberry plants in pots? I have, I have two that look like bushes, one that looks like a vine donated from a neighbor that moved away. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a vine blueberry. No. They're all shrubs. <laughs> the one that your neighbor gave you, um, it's probably well, I guess a, you, probably ha you have a, a Franken shrub, dear. Um, it was probably incorrectly pruned um, or um, uh, got damaged, and all you have is a single stalk. Um, let it let it grow out. See, it it should give you branches. There are uh, cultivars also that some that actually grow taller, some that grow smaller. So, you know, it depends on what cultivar you have, basically. That's true. Yeah. Well, and you're going to do the same thing you would with anything you're going to overwinter in a pot. Don't let the root ball dry out. If it if you if you know the look up blueberries, I, I, I don't grow blueberries. I'm not familiar with what zone they're hardy in. But if you think they're not going to be hardy, pull them under cover. You know, if it gets really cold, rat, I mean, just all the same thing for anything. The blueberries are pretty hardy. They were growing them up in northern Quebec. Yeah, that's what I'm northern thinking. Northern Alberta, oh, yeah. they grow them everywhere. Yeah. So. Don't let that root ball dry out. Well, then don't make it yeah. soggy wet, but don't let it dry out. And I think they'll be fine. Okay. Oh, Rime. Rime is row cover. It's, it's that white name. stuff. It's yeah. Yeah. It yeah. comes in different. It comes in different weights, though. So if you want to use it as a frost cloth rather than as an insect barrier, I would look for a frost cloth or rime that's a little heavier weight. Um, if you want it just to keep your carrot rust fly away or something like that, then you can use the lightest cover possible so that the plants can easily push up. But if you wanted to cover your plants to uh, prevent frost damage, then make sure you get a thicker material. How do we divide a sprawling lithodora? Well, lithodora sprawl. That's what they do. Just they are they are off. they are a ground cover. They are yeah. flowering ground cover. If it's got long in the spring, trim it back. You can you can trim up to two thirds of those lengths. If you're going to divide it, you only divide the plant from the center. So lift it, separate the roots cut the center and you have two plants. I bought a European gooseberry plant two years ago and I've had no fruit. Why? It is planted in the ground with my other fruit bushes that are all productive. It's in a sunny, well-drained, but moist soil. Uh, leap, uh, sleep, creep, leap. Yeah. Well, it may need to be a certain age before it's mature enough to... Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not growing a gooseberry. So I don't know. Yeah, a, a lot of these plants, like you're shocking them when you're putting them in the soil, right? If it's two years old. So you've got to give them time to develop a good root system and get enough vegetated growth on them so that they have the sugars to be able to provide the fruit. So I would probably leave it a year or so and just see. Chances are you'll get fruit next year. Well, you also might check and see if it's planted too deeply. True. That you you need to have a, a gooseberry. Now that's going to be one that sends up the cane, cane, right? Yeah. So you need to have the the top of the root ball where the canes come out of. That needs to be right at soil surface. So if, gooseberry gooseberry is more like a blueberry in its growth habit, actually. Yeah, yeah. and it doesn't so, it, but it it doesn't want to be too dry. Too deep. Yeah, and it doesn't want to be too dry, and it 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 will take three years before it really gives you fruit there you go yeah and and the other thing is make sure gooseberries are particularly susceptible to the soft fly so i've had gooseberries that have been totally defoliated round about in may so make sure that very early on in the life of the gooseberry leaves uh, you check for any little slugs uh, not slugs but bugs um, to make sure that they don't get away from you and uh, and if you do that very carefully then you should get away without having the total the uh, plant totally defoliated so that so 
uh, so Dorothy, that's the soft lie rather than the, soft, than the gooseberry the, soft lie. That's correct. Gooseberry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I'm not that familiar with them. So. Yeah. Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. Your advice on plant, on not planting alliums in the same place oh. every year, should one come back by themselves? Oh. Dug up and moved? Now, are you talking about ornamental alliums or are you talking about perennial chives? I, I think basically what happened is she missed one in the ground and it just started growing again. Could It could be, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know if it's a problem. I don't even know if you need to move it. Uh, if it has rust on it, then do get rid of it. But, you know. Yeah. You're One you're bulb like that, in a, a massive garden is not going to, you know, destroy it. Yeah. Okay, next What's, question. Oh, this is interesting. Instead yeah. of cardboard for doing about mulching to get rid of lawn. Um, and this this is where people really, you know, we're, we're taking sides on the whole cardboard thing. Um, mm -hmm. What what works really well, it, it's more labor intensive because the, the truth is cardboard will kill the lawn if that's what you want to do. But it it has so many negative aspects to it that that it's not a good thing to do. So when I've wanted to get rid of lawn, what I do is I pull the sod up and then I turn it over, turn it over. right on top where it is. And and then if I need to, um, it, what you need to do is just make sure there's no light getting at the the grass itself so if you turn it over make sure all the grass is kind of tucked under even cover it with a little bit of soil so that you're just blocking the light that's all you need to do to kill a lawn is block the light is block the light and i've i've uh um uh, i've always done the the method that you uh just explained deborah but i i do know people that have had success with just putting down black plastic letting the sun just solarize it mm -hmm. and it are dead um, right. And, and you're still going to have to dig it. Too. See, this this is the thing. If you're getting rid of the lawn, you're still going to have to dig it. So why don't you just dig it? Yeah. Rather than doing two or three things. Well, and and the thing about turning over the sod, if you do it when the soil is wet, it you know or moist at least, it's not too bad a job. Yeah. You turn it, you just scrape it up. It's about this deep. Turn it over. And if you need to put black plastic on it for a little while, for a while to solarize it or to uh, block the light, that's okay. The problem with people using cardboard is they tend to leave it because they think, well, it's gonna de it's gonna decay and it's gonna you know just disappear. Right. Well, it does it doesn't. It's got all those chemicals. It's got glue. Exactly. And the other thing too is is that the cardboard's not going to kill one of the most pervasive pests. Uh, in uh, grass, uh, and that's your wire worm. Mm. And the wire worm is just fine in the lawn. They, they coexist just fine. But people dig up lawns to put in flower beds or vegetable beds, and then they really have a problem because yeah. the wire worm um, loves all those young plants. And um, if you're going to do that, and you put the black plastic on it, you create that heat, you, you kill those, uh, those pests that live in the sod. And, and all the worms, because they're mesophilic, they just say, I'm out of here, and they head down where it's cool. This is a question for Dorothy, who's given some people <laughs> sprouting <Yes>. broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Dorothy. Oh, sure. Actually, it's Purple sprouting broccoli is one of my all-time favorites, and in the spring, I can I have usually two plants in my garden, and I can hardly keep up with this purple sprouting broccoli. So you can see why I like it so much. Um, having said that, though, with all those plants that are most productive in the spring, you have to get a good-sized plant into the crown in about. Uh, no later than mid-April, and when I uh, April, I mean August. So by mid-August, you should put a plant that's probably about 8 to 10 inches tall into the ground. That gives it enough chance to grow in the fall. I, I did exactly that this year. That gives it enough chance from the sort of mid-August 
to when the growing season is uh, pretty well over, which is now, to make a good size plant. So the plants that I put in in August, mid-August, are now probably about all four, somewhere between four and five feet tall. And then in the spring, they really go gangbusters and make all these wonderful little side shoots of uh, purple sprouting broccoli, just wonderful. But now, no, you need to seed right. them in April, plant them out in August, and then you'll have a wonderful vegetable come next spring. And that is probably the, the, the single um, uh, most repeated mistake um, about winter uh, vegetables is that people think that they plant them in in uh, in autumn, but no, <laughs> they're no. almost they're almost all biennials. They take a long time to get started, and you have to start them in spring, and then and then as Dorothy says, plant them out uh, at latest in August. You you eat them in winter. You don't grow them in winter. That's exactly it. The other thing I think people don't understand is it's these, these things that they think of as winter vegetables, they're growing when it's, I mean, when it's, it's cooler and they're and then in, in the early spring, but they need a little bit of warmth to germinate. You can't germinate them this time of year. It's too cold for that. And, and there's not enough light. The days are short, so they're not going to grow at all. And what people don't realize um, in this climate, we call them winter vegetables, all across Europe, they are the garden <laughs> and they, they depend on having those plants. And there's something that they call the hungry gap, which is late January into March. And that's when all those winter vegetables that we call winter vegetables are harvested and um, other things don't grow and those do, and those get you through the hungry gap. Okay, we have a question from Brenda about moving asparagus plant. And not to interrupt too badly, but we're just in the last four minutes. So we're going <laughs> to get through these last four questions in four minutes. Take it okay. away, Richard. Okay, asparagus. When, when I, I grew them, I never moved them. <laughs> yes, but they, they move really well if you do that in uh, round about the time of CD Sunday. So you dig them out in February and move them to wherever you want to have them. February, March is an excellent time to do it. Okay. I, I'd, like, I'd like to answer this question about is newspaper equally as bad as cardboard? It's bad from the standpoint that it blocks the gas exchange at the soil surface. It yeah. is not full of PFAs and forever chemicals like cardboard is. But and, it, yeah, I, and news, newspaper ink is biodegradable. It yes, is. it's usually soy based. Okay, yeah. so Not Jennifer says uh, the, yeah. they're perennial chives, so no rust. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, all chives are, all chives are perennial. Like, like orangey pustules on yeah. the leaves. Yeah. Any, any, any critter or disease that they call rust is usually called that because of the color. That doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they all are related or the same disease. Like there's rust on roses. There's there's uh, I had rust on my um, uh, red flowering currant, but they're different organisms. It's just the color yeah. is why we call them rust. Okay, so these last four questions we've answered them already. Yep. Good job. Ta -da! <laughs> and I've set a reminder in my phone to move my asparagus in February. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good. <laughs> We're going to make a gardener out of you yet, Darby. Oh, it's oh, working. Darby does oh, well. I'm with you, Deborah. I'm too lazy she's, to bring she's in. She's receiving a plant osmosis. beneath my protection. <laughs> make it under some mulch where they don't make it. <laughs> oh, okay, I, folks, I'm out of here. Goodbye. Nice Thank seeing you, so you all. Everybody. Nice yeah, answering Dorothy. my questions. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Thank you. We're going to make this video available. Uh, we normally get it out tomorrow morning. And we will send it out to all the registrants. And we'll also include the um, link for the all of the sessions. There's such great sessions. Um, I was actually, I missed the lawn and lawn alternatives last month. So, uh, or in September, and I was watching part of it. And they were taught, he was talking about cardboard and plastic too. So everything starts to mesh together. If you're new to this and you're overwhelmed, it'll all start making sense. And I've been working on next year's yeah. schedule. 
So February, we have unusual vegetables, uh, raised beds in March, spring bulbs in April, beneficial insects in May. June, we have annual borders and hanging baskets. July, we have ground covers and prostrate shrubs. August 11th, my favorite, greenhouse gardening. <laughs> Uh, we on uh, September, we have rain gardens. October, we have winter pruning. And November, Darby's favorite, soil health. <laughs> We're going to be having an activity that involves cotton underwear for everybody to hopefully enjoy. If we oh, can. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all well, for joining us good night, this everybody. year. And it's been enjoyable. Thank you, Darby. Thank you so and much, Richard. April. Thanks for all of your questions. Yes.